Hello everybody, how are you doing today? We're gonna be going over hepatitis B as in boy. That's our lecture. Now what are going to be our objective that we're gonna cover in this lecture? First we want to know what the structure of hepatitis B is. We're gonna go over how is it being transmitted among people? What is the pathogenesis of the infection? We're also gonna go over the serologic course in order to for us to be able to differentiate between acute and chronic hepatitis B infection. Then we're gonna figure out how we make the diagnosis and how do we treat. And that's it. So let's start. On the right side of the board, I've drawn out a beautiful structure of hepatitis B. We're gonna start one by one by looking at the outermost structures of the virus. This little pointy little round mushroom looking structures, that is the hepatitis B HB surface antigen, which makes sense. The antigens that surround the outside of the virus. Then we walk our way inside the virus. The next thing in line, these little green dots that I drew on the board are actually the hepatitis E antigen, E as in early. That's why they call it E antigen. That actually stands for early antigen. And we're gonna find out why it's early. Then we move a little bit inside the virus and we meet this guy that looks like the chain. I drew them out as C. C will stand for what? The hepatitis B core antigen. That's the guy that's inside the virus. That's called the core antigen. Then we move a little bit further and we see this nice little icosahedral nucleocapsid. Actually, icosahedral is actually 20 triangles with about three edges and 12 vertices but we're just showing it as a little hexagon okay so but it's a nucleocapsid from the word nuclear what do you think is in the nucleus dna very good so the nucleocapsid of the virus actually encases the dna of the virus so hepatitis b is a DNA virus but there's also a protein that allows the virus to replicate right so that the DNA can be replicated and we can infect cells so it has a DNA polymerase from polymerization reaction making more copies now which family does hepatitis B belong to it's actually an hepatina virus Hepatina. Let's look at his family members. See the amazing viruses have their own families too? I don't want to meet their family. It's probably not fun. Hepatina. That is the family that hepatitis B belongs to. So okay, you can see H E P for heper. Hepatitis. Now let's look at the word hepatitis itself. Hepa means what? Hepat from the word hepatocyte. <gasps> ah, hepatocytes. So which part of the body do you think hepatitis B loves to attack? You bet you it's the liver. That's where the word came from. Hep hepatitis. But itis is what? Inflammation. So it's a type B virus that causes inflammation of the liver. Now that we have known what the structure of hepatitis B looks like, I want you to keep an eye on it because this will really explain a lot of things. Now let's go over the next thing. How is hepatitis B being transmitted? How will people get infected with hepatitis B? Usually it's from bloody body fluids. Blood. 
or body fluids. So if a patient is infected with hepatitis B and you get exposure to a needle, right? If you get exposure to the needle that has been used to deliver uh, you know, medication or whatever to the patient, if you get stuck with this needle and you already have an, an active hepatitis B infection, that's how you get infected. Also, if somebody needs blood transfusion, right? People lose blood all the time. They become hypotensive and tachycardic. Maybe they got into a car accident, right? Or they try to have a baby and they have lost so much blood during the process, they might need to be transfused. Or they even have a GI bleed. They need a blood transfusion. And way back in the days, blood that, that weren't screened properly might have hepatitis B virus in it. Now today you won't find it as common because blood actually screened properly in the hospitals. So the chance of actually getting hepatitis B from blood transfusion today is very, very low. It's almost impossible because we catch it. But people can also, but if somebody gets a blood transfusion product that's infected, that's how they also get reinfected. Also, remember needles. People that do IV drug abuse, right? They share needles. If somebody has hepatitis B and you share the same needles, they can get infected. IV drug abuse, IVDA. Also sex, right? Because you can exchange body fluids during sexual activity, patients can actually get infected through sex. So, that is how you get transmission of hepatitis B. Check, check. Let's now go over the pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is the mechanism by which the virus infects, go in and attack the liver cells. So, the hepatocytes are usually the target of the hepatitis B virus. And the way that to actually get inside a cell is by binding to an unknown receptor. So let's try to draw out an hepatocyte. So this is an hepatocyte. I'm going to try to draw an hepatocyte because they kind of look like this shape. And they have receptors. We're going to give them little receptors. And this will be an hepatocyte. The hepatitis B virus is gonna land, right? It's gonna land on top of this unknown receptor. So what I'm gonna do is just draw one hepatitis B. There you go. That'll be a little baby hepatitis B virus, by the way. Okay. Binds to an unknown receptor on the hepatocyte. And the process by which you get into the cell is called endocytosis. It gets engulfed into, binds, and fuses, and gets inside the cell. By endocytosis, endo means inside the cell. Now, when this gets in, taken into the hepatocyte, automatically, this is the beginning of an acute hepatitis B infection. Now, the patient's liver cells has been infected, so let's draw the new virus inside the cell. Ha! Ah, now it's red. That's danger. It's in the building. And let's just kind of put the nucleus of the hepatocyte in there. This is the hepatocyte nucleus. Now, once you get infected, What's gonna happen? You gonna, because this is an inflammatory process, an inflammatory cascade reaction is gonna set in. And all of a sudden, the body's gonna be like, wait a minute, I think we got an intruder. Yes, that is true. We get an alarm. Yeah, somebody broke into the system. It's a virus. Now, the liver, I mean, the body host response is gonna respond to this by releasing virus-specific cytokines. The body responds to this, the body say, no, 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 this is not your apartment, don't come in here. Virus-specific 
cytokines this like little perfumes to tell T lymphocytes to come to the spot T lymphocytes to be recruited into the liver where when the T lymphocytes come in these are actually cytotoxic let's look at the word cytotoxic cyto means cell they're actually toxic to the cell itself so the viruses are running I mean the the lymphocytes are running to the spot to go find the virus and kill it. It's an assassination uh, mission. Now, in the process of trying to destroy the virus, like they're shooting and they're killing, and the T lymphocytes are trying to destroy the virus, the cells are going to be destroyed. Their parasites are going to be destroyed. And this is going to lead to hepatocellular damage. So they're going to cause hepatocellular damage right because the T cells are trying to what kill the virus inside the cells so as we're trying to clear the virus the lymphocyte the the parasites are also getting destroyed when they get destroyed that process is what we is the inflammation that's going on inside the cell now the hepatocytes have enzymes and clinically what does this mean well when these hepatocytes get destroyed they're going to release the enzymes that live within their cells let's actually make them blue the enzymes that live within the cells are going to be released and when these are released these are known as alt and ast Alanine, amino transferase, and aspartate, amino transferase enzymes. And when these are released, this is what we can measure clinically from the patient's serum because the, the hepatocytes have been destroyed and they're released. But the most specific to the liver that's going to be higher is going to be the ALT. ALT is going to be very, very high when you have an acute hepatitis B infection. Now let's talk about the, how the, the course of the infection of hepatitis B actually works now that we know the pathogenesis of the disease. So, when somebody gets infected with hepatitis B, do they know? Actually, 70%, let's talk about a serologic course, 70% of people that get infected with this virus have no idea they have the virus. Let's talk about serology. That's the course of the infection. So when somebody gets an acute infection, actually about 70% are asymptomatic asymptomatic which means they don't even know they got an infection that's why we call hepatitis B a silent disease that's why we call it a silent disease and I will tell you why in a minute now about 20% of patients get infected with hepatitis B can develop severe symptoms they can develop symptoms and what kind of symptoms are we talking about well this will be uh, we call this kind of symptom actually an ecteric ecteric hepatitis icterus from the word yellow jaundice hepatitis and I'm going to talk about that also but there's another population of people actually it's a 25 percent five percent of patients can actually go to become chronic hepatitis B carriers. Now let's talk about what the symptoms are. When I say 70% of patients that get infected might not know that they have the disease, it's because it always presents like a flu-like symptoms. When patients get infected with hepatitis B, it's like a flu. You feel like ah, I just have a flu. What kind of what are the signs and symptoms of flu? Let's start. So let's go down. 
it feels like a flu-like symptoms. For the people that actually have symptoms, they might have mild symptoms out of this people flu-like symptoms such as what? Fever, chills, myalgias, right? Joint aches. They also have symptoms such as a little bit of nausea. They might have some headaches, loss of appetite. Headaches, loss of appetite. They might feel a little bit nauseous. For patients that actually develop mild symptoms, it feels like you're just having a flu. So patients don't know they're actually having an hepatitis B viral infection. But these are usually mild flu-like symptoms. However, if you do develop a severe enteric hepatitis, these are the symptoms patients are now going to present with. Well, now, if it's an enteric from the word jaundice, right, enteric symptoms, patients are now going to have right upper quadrant pain. Why do they have right upper quadrant pain? Because this is exactly where the liver is, right? The liver is in the right upper quadrant. So patients can ha will have right upper quadrant pain. They will have fever. They might, they'll be jaundiced. They'll feel, they'll have yellow manifestations in their eyes and their skin. Why are they jaundiced? Well, if you're having an infection inside the liver, it's going to affect the biliary tree. It can allow you to spill bilirubin inside the blood, which causes you to develop the jaundice symptoms. We actually make your eyes, if you look right under their eyes, you see it's actually yellow. And if sometimes you can look under the, look at, look their skin. Um, you see it's kind of yellowish. All right. So I th this is called icteric symptoms. All right, now, we now need to go over when the patient have an acute versus chronic infection, starting with an infection of hepatitis B. Now, what am I talking about? Most people, when they get the infection of hepatitis B, their body actually clears the virus. The body mounts antibodies against the antigens, and you get rid of the virus, and you're fine. But Unfortunately, because 5% of people can progress to chronic hepatitis B, that is why this is a serious disease, all right? So now, we now need to draw out a graph, graphical representation of the serologic course of an acute hepatitis B infection. Using a graph. Now, this is a graph that I'm drawing out to represent, this graph is to represent an acute hepatitis B infection that a patient actually recovered from. So this is an acute hepatitis B infection with complete recovery. On the right, on the y-axis, are going to be titers, which means the viral titers. On the x-axis, we're going to put weeks or months, preferably actually weeks, of how a patient have an infection of hepatitis B. I want you to focus on this graph very carefully because it's going to explain a lot of how we detect and make the diagnosis of hepatitis B. This is actually the fun part. When the patient get infected with hepatitis B, they start to get an acute reaction, right? Those flu-like symptoms start about a week to two weeks after they get infection from the virus. Well, when the virus gets into the cell, the first thing that's gonna go up, right? The first thing that's gonna go up when we measure a titer during an acute hepatitis B infection is the hepatitis B surface antigen. So let's draw that out. So it's zero weeks. Let's say this is zero weeks. And let's make this four weeks. So in the first 
two weeks, we're going to use black to represent the rise in the hepatitis B surface antigen. So, ding, ding, ding. see that? This is the hepatitis B surface antigen level is going to rise. That is showing us you have an infection of hepatitis B. Now, as soon as the virus is infecting the hepatocyte, what do you think the body is doing? The body is smart. It's like, I'm not going to allow you to have fun and just, you know, destroy my cells. I'm going to start to recruit antibodies, antibodies against you. So what kind of antibodies are we going to first make? We're going to start making IgM antibodies right away. We're not going to mess around just right in there. So I'm going to make that little dash. See how the IgM is rising, but which I this IgM is actually being made not against the hepatitis B surface antigen. No, 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 no. We're going to start from the inside out. We're going to start attacking the core antigens. So since it's red, you know what? Let's make that red so we can track the core antigens. Actually, that makes more sense here. Let's use red. We're going to start attacking the core by making antibodies against the core. So thus, immediately, IgM anti-hepatitis B, anti, anti B core antigen antibody. That's the first antibody we're going to make right here against the core. Are you following? Good. But because the, we are making antibodies, we try to get rid of the virus, all of a sudden, the virus is going to peak. The surface antigen is going to peak and start to drop. It's dropping because the body is trying to mount an immune response to it and try to kill the virus as fast as we can. So during that process, as, as long as we try to kill most of the viruses and we're making antibodies, the IgM will drop also. Now, I have to warn you that as the, vi the viral level, the surface antigen of hepatitis B is start to rise, this is the exact time, right? This is the time where you're having symptoms, symptoms of hepatitis. What are the symptoms? It feels like you're having a flu, you're having fever, myalgias, headaches, nauseous, loss of appetite, you're vomiting, right? You don't feel right. Yeah, this is around the time because the surface antigen is rising inside the bloodstream. If I catch you at that time and draw out your blood, I'll find out your, core, your hepatitis B surface antigen is going to be very, very high. But wait a minute. What about the E antigen? Why do we call it early? Oh, it's early for a reason because during an early stage of the infection, we can also detect this inside the bloodstream. So it's also important to note that we can draw a little graph here and say the hepatitis B E antigen is going to be present during the acute phase of the reaction. So acute phase. So let's make this an acute phase of the infection. So what do we find? We find an hepatitis B surface antigen and hepatitis B early antigen. Now what does early antigen actually represent? It actually signifies the presence of an acute infection and the patient is highly infected. So, and also, E antigen represents high infectiv infectivity by the patient and also high levels of viral replication. Let's write that at the end of the board here so we don't forget. So E, hepatitis B early antigen, equals high rate of viral replication plus high infectivity. Now how do I remember hepatitis B E antigen? Well, let me draw exactly what it looks like for real. It's actually a bomb.
This is the E antigen. See that? That is a bomb. I think of E as an explosion, an explosion during the acute infection of hepatitis B because when it explodes, it's very, very effective. So if somebody gets, if you see it, measure this and you find out a patient has high levels of this inside the blood, ooh, that is not the time you want to get stuck with that needle. Uh-uh, uh-uh, they are very, very infectious. Now let's keep on continue our story. As we are making IgM, which is the first antibody that's made against the core, we need to make IgG against the core antibody against the core antibody. So we're not gonna forget that the body eventually will start to make let's actually keep that also in red during the same time. Because the end goal of the body is to make IgG. So eventually we're gonna make IgG against the core, hepatitis B core antibody over time. Just at the same time as we are making IgM, see IgM is going to drop off, but IgM is not going to last, so we want to keep the IgG around against the core antigen. Also, because we, we already have the exposure to the E antigen, the body needs to make antibody against the hepatitis B early antigen. So we make an IgG against, it's called an anti-hepatitis B early antigen. All right, because we've been exposed. The body has to make an antibody. So next time you get infected, we already have the antibodies against it. Now, what about the surface antigen? The body still needs to make an antibody, but it takes time. It takes time. So therefore, once we clear, see how the hepatitis B surface antigen goes up and it gets cleared out of our system. As we are getting clearance out of the system, the body starts to make IgG, IgG, against the hepatitis B surface antigen. This is what you want to become immune to the virus. You need this to become immune to the virus. IgG anti-hepatitis B surface antigen. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, not Ag, there should be an Ag there, okay? That just should be supposed to be an IgG anti hepatitis B surface, all right? Because this is telling us, wait a minute, you're cured. You develop an acute hepatitis B infection and you have recovered. You got exposed to the virus and you got exposed to the surface antigen which is binding to your liver cells, right? They got destroyed, we made antibodies against them, we cleared them out of your system over a period of weeks and later we made antibodies against the surface antigen. Now this is extremely important. Now people always talk about what is the window period? There's a little window in there and we don't know. Okay, let's talk about the window period. The window period is the time whereby the body is mounting an immune response and successfully clearing the virus out of your system. So you got exposed, right? You got exposed to the virus, but because think about it, we gotta go to the factory to make antibody. It takes time. We gotta go to Japan, go to France, get the parts. No, I'm kidding. We gotta get the parts. The body gotta assemble the antibodies, right? Because the B cells gotta be made into plasma cells. Plasma cells gotta make IgM. IgM eventually have to undergo transformation, and they have to be. And IgG has to be made. It takes quite a little bit of time. So guys, take a chill pill, relax. Now the time between when we actually start making IgG and when the surface antigen is being destroyed and take it clear, being cleared out of our system is called the window period. Let's make the graph actually here. Okay. So when somebody's in the window period, they're not going to be positive for a a surface antigen because we're already getting cleared out of the system 
the only thing you're going to be able to measure when you catch somebody during the window period where they, are they still have an infection but it's been cleared is you're going to be able to detect this inside their bloodstream. They're going to be making antibodies to the core antigen because as you can see here, the only thing you'll be able to detect between when the surface antigen is being cleared and making of this antibody right here is the core. There we go. See how that makes sense? So if you do a serologic test and the patient's hepatitis B surface antigen comes back negative and they don't have an IgG against the surface antigen, which means it's not ready to be made yet from the factory, you're going to see a positive IgG against the core. Ah, and you say, look at you. Mm. You actually have an infection. You just haven't cleared the virus yet, but we can detect it. All right. So this will be a great time to talk about, wait a minute. Well, after six months, somebody makes IgG against the surface antibody and they're cured. What about six months later? Let's kind of cut the graph and say six months later, they're still positive for the hepatitis B surface antigen. <gasps> what? What are you saying? You're trying to say that? No, yeah, they're still positive. That means they, they graduated and become a chronic carrier. Because normal people, when they get exposed, right, we destroy the surface antigen, we make a bunch of antibodies, right, to the core, to the early ones, and eventually even to the surface. Look at that. We're making antibodies to this guy, this guy, and this guy. All three guys, we need to eventually make antibodies against them. But if we can't, and we still have a positive surface antigen, they now become a chronic carrier. They're going to be carrying for the rest of their lives. And those are the five percent I am very, very concerned about. Okay, let's go about some exercises. To so put all this graph into a picture, like actually make sense out of all this. So, the first exercise we're gonna go over is when we we'll order labs. Actually, let's order labs and see if we can answer the following questions. We draw a serology, and this is what the serology of the patient comes back to. The patient has hepatitis B surface antigen positive. And also, they have hepatitis B early antigen positive. That's the serology. After we drew the labs, what do you think is going on? Well, they have an antigen positive and the early antigen which represents they're very infective. This is an acute, an acute, it's not acute, it's actually an acute hepatitis B infection okay and also they have negative IgG anti let's erase this so we get some space we did serologic course now we are doing diagnosis right anti hepatitis B surface see they don't have any antibodies but they only have antigens this is what we found in their bloodstream we found this guy and we found this guy that means they're highly infective and they have an acute hepatitis b infection good got it excellent let's go have a second one we order another lab and this is what it comes back to the patient has an hepatitis b surface antigen comes back negative yeah exactly However, they have an IgG anti-hepatitis B surface antibody. How can you make an antibody against an antigen and you have a negative surface antigen? How can you do that? Well, 
the patient is not infected. No, 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 no. This is a patient that received the hepatitis B vaccine. Yeah, we go. The patient was vaccinated because they never had the antigen exposure, right? But now they also have the antibody because that's what you get. Once you get the vaccine, the vaccines allow you to develop antibodies against the surface antigen without being infected. So these patients got their vaccine and that's why their lab comes back this way. See that? This is how you put it in together clinically. Let's look at the next patient case. This patient had an IgG anti anti hepatitis B core. Ah, their core was positive. They also have an hepatitis B surface antigen was negative, right? Also, they have an IgG anti hepatitis B surface antibody came back positive. What do you think the patient had? Think about it. Hmm, let's see. They have a negative antigen. They also have a positive anti antibody against the surface antigen. Almost looks like the guy that was vaccinated, but something is interesting. Where did the core come from? <gasps> ah, wait a minute. The only way you can get the core of the virus in your body is by getting the infection. <gasps> ah, see that? The core is inside the virus. Uh -huh. So you can only make an antibody against the core if you got infected. This was a patient that had a past infection of hepatitis B and they recovered. They got cured. Their body got infected. They cleared the surface antigen. Remember how the graph goes up and down? But they made an IgG anti uh, hepatitis B core. And they also made an IgG against the surface antigen. So the next time the virus comes over, they say, sorry, dude, we we'll recognize you. We've got the soldiers that are going to recognize and they're going to shoot you like snipers. Got it? Well, we're not done yet. How about... If you get an IgG, an anti-hepatitis B core that was positive, you check the surface antigen and it was negative. We check the antibody against the surface antigen and it was negative. Hmm. That doesn't make any sense. We have an antibody against the core, but the surface antigen can't be found inside the bloodstream at all. And without, we don't have an antibody yet um, against the surface antigen. Ah, I think somebody's sitting in the window. Ah, what, what did you say? Yeah, somebody is sitting in the window, period window period. Remember I told you when the patient is during the window period, they're actually clearing the virus. They're mounting antibodies and they're destroying the virus. But because it takes time, we've cleared the surface antigen, but we haven't had time yet to make the antibody. But look at what we've made so far. We've made some progress. We've made some antibody against the core. Aha! Which means the patient is still infected but they are actually during the window period. All right? Remember, just again to remind you, the E, which is early, shows a signs of high infection. That's why these patients have an acute hepatitis B infection. All right? So, uh-oh, okay, also, before we move on, we also need to remember that it could be IgG or also IgM, right? Just not IgG against the core, because remember IgM is made first. 
So if a patient just have an IgM against, oh, that's the last but not the least actually exercise. If a patient has an IgM against the core antibody, what do you think that represents? Well, and they also have a negative surface antibody. That's our last but not the least exercise before I forget. And let me do this. They haven't made an antibody yet against the surface antigen. What do you think the patient has? Well, it looks similar to get on top, but in this case, it's just IgM, right? Instead of IgG, this shows that the patient is during the window period, right? They cleared the antibodies, uh, they cleared the antigen, but they're waiting to make the antibody. So that's the IgM. That also represents uh, the window period, okay? Now, remember, 95% of patients that get infected will clear the virus, but that 5% is what we're worried about. Now, we said the 5% are gonna move on six months later to have a chronic hepatitis B infection. Let's take a look at their graph, graphically, what this looks like. So in a chronic hepatitis B carrier, let's use um, blue. Chronic Hep B carry. Let's draw the graph. We have titers and we have about, let's make months in this case. So normally, this is what will happen in a chronic hepatitis B carry, right? They'll get an infection. They'll get an infection. Just like everybody else, dun, dun, dun. and the surface antigen, let's actually break this a little bit, will rise and rise, and instead of falling like the normal one in acute infection, the surface antigen parallels, and they continue to be positive for the hepatitis B surface antigen, because they never made an effort to clear the virus. Also. This patients will have, they will make antibodies, however, against the core, but that is not strong enough. So remember the core is blue, they'll make IgMs just as regular. The IgM is gonna drop, but they'll still make IgGs. They'll make IgGs. I get anti-hep B core. Now you might say to yourself, wait a minute, but they, 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 they have an antibody against the, the, the core. Well, uh, that, that's not gonna help. Remember the surface is what binds to the receptor and their parasites. As long as they're still having a positive surface antigen, that means they're carriers, they're highly infectious. So they'll make, they'll make IgMs, anti-hepatitis B core, they even make an IgG, but they're still gonna be chronic carriers after six months, six months, six months, that's what you wanna remember. Six months later, they do not convert. Now, what about the early antigen? Well, for early antigen, usually these patients, it could be variable. It could be high or it could be low. So, let's just put it at the top of the graph so we don't forget. Let's find a nice early antigen that's in green. So, when they get the course of the infection, they develop a hepatitis B surface antigen. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the, and, uh, the, and uh, they might make even antibodies against the early antigen. But remember, this is not enough to cover you to become immune, immune to the virus. The problem is they have the surface antigen is still positive and they're gonna be chronic carriers of hepatitis B virus. Now, let's go over 
how we actually treat this disease. Treatment. Well, there's different medications we give to treat hepatitis B virus. Well, my name is Adeleke. Let's try to spell my name. This is my name. Adeleke. So, in order for me to remember all the drugs that actually cause it, that we used to treat hepatitis B, I said, I'll change instead of Adelaide, I'll make it Adelaide, something like that. But it's, and I look at the word, I'm like, it looks like uh, a delete. Hmm, a delete. That looks perfect. That's the mnemonic we're going to use. A, which is actually going to be the alpha interferon. Ah, that's what we use to treat hepatitis B. D, another drug. Adefovir. Adefovir. Let me show you where the mnemonic is so you see it. Adefovir. The next drug is L. Lamivudina. Lamivudina. A D E. The next is. The next drug is Entecaver, right? The vir antiviral drug Entecaver. And T stands for Tenophobia. Or the other drug, te uh, Telbivudin. Tel. Tel. Buvidin. So, really T E. That's the mnemonic. Can you see A D E L E T E? I delete. Sounds like A delete, and that's how I actually remember. Because my name is Adeleke, so I just said Adeleke, but instead of Adeleke, I just made it Adelaide. If that works for you, perfect. If you can memorize these drugs without like cracking your brains apart, and if you can remember my name, or just says A delete, and you can actually carve out all the treatments we used to treat hepatitis B. Now, most people, because this is an asymptomatic disease and it's a silent disease, it's very important if somebody gets exposed to the virus either through any blood products and they get tested, they need to get post exposure prophylaxis. And what do you give? If somebody gets exposed, they get a needle, they get the hepatitis B vaccine so they can make antibodies against the virus and they need to get the hepatitis B immunoglobulin there we go so for pro if you get exposed to the virus you do through vaccine or blood uh, 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 needles you want to get a vaccine right away and also you want to get the hepatitis B immunoglobulin also no, known as HBIG it's actually the antibodies the IgG antibody against the surface antigen now why do I care about the 5% again that developed that chronic infection because chronic hepatitis B will cause you to have damage hepatocellular damage to the liver if damage will lead to what fibrosis and fibrosis of the liver is known as liver cirrhosis the problem with patients that develop risk of cirrhosis are have an increased risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma that is why we care about the five percent that develop chronic hepatitis B that is the end result 
okay cancer of the liver that's what the virus can cause although most people are fine to get an infection to clear it this is what we always worry about in the patient that develop chronic long term for the rest of their life they're carrying the virus they do they develop liver cirrhosis which has a lot of complications and so part of hypertension right and then they can also develop liver cancer so this basically brings us to the end of hepatitis B remember this virus is very very silent disease you feel like you just have some flu like symptoms patients don't even think about it unless they get tested and we get back to serology and make a determination if you have an acute infection or you've cleared it or you need to be vaccinated or you need to be treated with medications if you are predisposed to develop chronic hepatitis don't forget this is the drugs that we used to treat and if you get exposed you get a vaccine or get the immunoglobulin and that basically wraps up hepatitis B as in boy Thank you very much for watching. It's Adela K from Future Teaching Physicians. I want you to go on my website and watch more videos that I've created for you in cardiology, endocrine, cardiovascular system, even we're talking about gastrointestinal system and almost every system you can think of in internal medicine and just go to FTP lectures dot com to access over 80 hours of internal medicine videos that made ridiculously easy just like the one you've watched thank you very much sadly again till i see you again have a great day bye bye